Wei Ang, who is the chief product officer at Talab, the largest tech company in the Middle East. I came to the Middle East in Dubai about five and a half years ago, where product was such a, a new discipline. Joined the company when we were 100 people in product and engineering, and now we're a team of 550 people. What's your strategy there? Are you trying to build like a super app that includes all those services in one place, or are you trying to create like micro apps? One thing that we don't want to do is to just, you know, launch 50 verticals all at once. We are a strong believer that to build a product customers love, you have to go really deep. There are some competitors that come up, so they tend to specialize. And so from a strategic standpoint, how do you maintain that competitive advantage to make sure that you can still go deep enough across multiple categories while maintaining your leadership position? You have to put the customer at the heart of it. At the end of the day, if you forget about your customers, if you forget about the problem that you're solving, that's when a company starts to lose its soul, that's when a product starts to lose its soul, and that's when you open the door to competition. This episode is brought to you by Pendo the all-in-one product management platform for any type of application. With Pendo, you don't have to bounce around multiple tools to figure out what's really happening inside your product. Pendo makes it easy to answer critical questions about how users are engaging with your product and then turn those insights into action. Also, you can get your users to do what you actually want them to do. Visit pendo.io slash product school to create your free account today and start building better experiences across every single corner of your product. That's pendo.io slash product school. Hey, hey everyone, this is Carlos. I'm the CEO at Product School. And today I'm here with Yi Wei Ang, who is the Chief Product Officer at Talabat, the largest tech company in the Middle East. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Carlos. Super excited to be here. Uh, excited to have you back. Uh, you were one of our speakers at ProductCon London a year ago, and uh, you did so well that we decided to invite you again. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here and, and to share a bit of my story also. You know, been, uh, been a long journey here in the Middle East, actually. You know, you were saying, you know, I, I came to the Middle East in Dubai about five and a half years ago, where product was such a, a new discipline, you know, to, to the region. Um, this is my second company in the Middle East. I've been at Talabad now for four years. Joined the company when we were 100 people in product and engineering, trying to figure ourselves out, you know, what exactly was product management and product design and data science. And now we're a team of 550 people located in Dubai as our primary hub and also Cairo and Egypt as our second hub. Uh, so it's been a really good journey. You know, we've, we've grown the business a lot. You know, we started as a food delivery business. Now we do food, we do groceries, we do pharmacy. Uh, we have a subscription product. You know, it's really evolved over the last couple of years. I'm really excited to, to be here. So you saw the company grow from 100 employees to 5,500? So the, the product and engineering team grew from 100 uh, to 550 um, over, over the course of four years, yeah. Okay. And um, you mentioned that this is a product, global product serving multiple countries. So how do you structure the different units? Yeah. One thing that we try to do is get actually our product and engineering teams really close to the business and customer problems, right? So historically, we've had a food business. It's a very core part of our business, still a very large team. You know, over time, we've also built a groceries business. So there's a sort of product and engineering team serving and building for those grocery needs. You know, buying groceries is such a different experience than buying food. We now have a fintech team also thinking about our, our, all of our different fintech products like Buy Now, Pay Later, which we launched about two years ago. Um, so we try and get really close to the customer problem and the business problem that we're trying to solve. And over the, over time, you know, that's how we sort of scaled out our product and engineering organization. Starabat um, sounds like a... So what are some of these U, similar businesses in the U.S.? Yeah, so I guess you can compare us to, to, to Uber Eats, you can compare us to DoorDash, you can compare us to Deliveroo uh, in the U.K., um, so yeah, we're we're one of the we we are one of the larger uh, food and grocery delivery players in, in the world today. So so the end goal is the Middle East market, and you also provide different services under the same platform. So what's your strategy there? Are you trying to be like a super app that includes all those services in one place, or are you trying to create like micro apps? Yeah, no, I think it's important to bring everyone into one experience. But one thing that we don't want to do is to just, you know, launch 50 verticals all at once. We are a strong believer that to do something that customers love, to build a product customers love, you have to go really deep. You know, food delivery, we've been trying to crack this now. Talaba is actually, you know, uh, almost 20 years old. So, you know, we, we started from a little website. We had, you know, restaurants actually getting orders through fax, you know, 20 years ago. 
And now we're, we're an online you know, food delivery player. And to do sort of a vertical really, really well, you got to go really deep. You know, so, you know, we, we start with food and went to groceries and we're thinking about other verticals. But I think it's important for us to really crack it very deeply, you know, as opposed to just spreading ourselves too thin and trying to, you know, do 50 verticals all at once. And are there any opportunities to cross sell between the different Absolutely. apps? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the way I think about it is, you know, we, we're serving such a core need for human beings, right? At the end of the day, you wake up, you know, and, and throughout your day, you probably eat three, some people eat four meals a day. And, you know, between you ordering in, you dining out, you ordering groceries and making your breakfast, we want to be able to cover all of those different use cases. But at the, at the same time, we also realize that, you know, food is such a social thing, right? Sometimes you want to dine out with your friends, sometimes you want to eat alone. And so the opportunities for us to introduce all of our different products and our, our different offerings at different moments is so key, which is why, you know, I believe that one of the biggest plays for, for us in the product organization at Talabat is a view on personalization, which is to really understand, like, are you at the office right now and you're having lunch and you only have 20 minutes and I should probably, you know, send you to the, the, the next sandwich shop that can deliver really quickly as opposed to this, you know, restaurant that's 60 minutes away that maybe is something that, you know, it's more social and maybe something more for the evening. So, you know, I think really getting to know your customers and, and what they're going through at the, at the specific moment so they can have a personalized experience is going to be a really next big play uh, for our product. So something that I uh, noticed, at least with the products that I use in the U.S., and um, some of them that, that you mentioned, is that eventually as the, each of those categories become big enough, let's say delivery, people delivery or food delivery, grocery shopping, uh, there are some competitors that come up and they just do one thing. So they tend to specialize. And so from a strategic standpoint, how do you maintain that competitive advantage to make sure that you can still go deep enough across multiple categories while maintaining your leadership position. And it's so important. You know, I think a lot of big companies as they scale, they get distracted. And I think that's why I always tell the teams and, and we try to really focus on Talabat is you have to put the customer at the heart of it. You know, it's so many companies as you scale out, you think about how do you monetize more? How do you squeeze more? How do you, how do you drive all of that? But really at the end of the day, if you forget about your customers, if you forget about the problem that you're solving, that's when a company starts to lose its soul. That's when a product starts to lose its soul. And that's when you open the door to competition. You know, so we're constantly thinking about, you know, what exactly customers are looking for. We have a big brand team now that also thinks about, you know, trends that are up and coming. You know, one big thing that we're learning, for example, is how social media is really, you know, becoming a new way for people to discover restaurants and food. Like, I don't know if, if, if you guys have talked about it in other podcasts and, and shows, but... Man, I've, I've learned recently that the new generation, they don't even use Google to search for restaurants and things. They, they use TikTok, they use Instagram, and, and those social elements are actually being used today to, to, to find out what restaurants to go to next. And so I think it's super important to really, you know, being a consumer brand, to be really close to what customers are doing so that you can really adapt the, the customer experience, you know, end to end uh, to what exactly, you know, people are looking for. We've had different product leaders from companies like uh, Instagram, Spotify, and even Sirius XM, which is a very traditional business that uh, is mostly an app installed in cars and about how they're personalizing experiences to truly make it one-to-one. -one. Um, but I'm always curious about how that's been applied in other markets. And you mentioned the Middle East because there's obviously differences, right? So I'm now thinking about what makes a product that is so localized win versus let's say an uber that typically has more vo global volume more global funding like what is it that you think that a local pl player can can get that an international player can't you know i think it's all about local context really you know to give you an example you know we for our groceries business for q1 of this year we had a really big focus on ramadan so ramadan is the month of fasting for for muslims and obviously the middle east it's a massive occasion you know a lot of cooking happens a lot of families come together in the evening so for the groceries business it's a massive you know um it's a massive deal right there's a lot of you know promotions going on from from all of the big brands you know uh for for food and desserts and things like that it's also a big social event. So, you know, restaurants also cater the menus and experiences very differently. And so as a local player, we can afford to invest in things like that because we, we're, we have skin in the game. Like at the end of the day, we're a Middle Eastern tech company and our customers, you know, really resonate with that. So for us, 
to be able to pour our heart and soul into this grocery experience. When you open the grocery experience, it tells you about, you know, uh, you know, what Ramadan deals are available to you and, and how many hours left, you know, before you can break your fast. Like these are experiences that because we're a Middle Eastern tech business, we have, you know, we, we, we really want to invest into. So I think that, you know, puts us in a unique position where, especially in, in, in our, our region and our audience, it, it resonates quite well. Uh, yes, you just reminded me of uh, the Uber and Didi story. Uh, Didi, main player in China, and how Uber started competing head to head, eventually had to merge with Didi uh, because they just got the local context in a way that was put to be much harder for, for, a, for a US player. And um, so I see that. Now, when you talk about the Middle East, like I'm, I'm from Spain, so it's like when people talk about Europe, right? Obviously, there's so many different sub-local cultures within even the country. You mentioned you have teams in uh, Dubai, teams in Cairo, you operate across different countries. So can you tell me more about how do you localize to the country level and even in some cases to the city or other types of way for you to, to, to split demographics? I think it's, I think that's actually getting, you know, to be a very hard problem. You know, we operate in eight different markets and I'll tell you sort of the spectrum of it, right? In the more mature markets, we, we launched in Kuwait a long time ago as our anchor. The the UAE, in Dubai, where I live, also massive. But we have new growth markets also. We launched in Iraq about two years ago, right? Different language, different locale, different competitive landscape. And I think it's it's really important for our product teams to really you know get a sense of what the different local nuances look like, right? And it's sometimes very easy for us, very comfortably in Dubai, we're sitting here and we're like, oh, yeah. All of the Middle East must feel like this. It's not 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 that at all. We actually today have started to build a practice. You know, the product operations practice today that actually gets very close to all of our different markets, right? So our product operations leader spends you know a, a week in Qatar, maybe a week in Bahrain, and then another week in Oman to really get to the local nuances, to understand what's a competitive landscape like, what is you know what is it like in logistics, what is it like in the in the restaurant business. How the margins different? You know what? 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 You know what are the social expectations? Like how's it? How's it? How are the nuances a little bit different? And we bring that back, and we have learning sessions. You know, as a product organization, we have, uh, you know, market deep dives. You know, that, that we can bring our 550 person product organization on board to. Um, and so that's one piece. And the other thing that we do also is when we when we build something and we ship something, we make sure that we get sort of local sponsors also. You know, I'm, I'm building a grocery experience and I maybe have the MD of Egypt that says, hey, I would love to be the sponsor of that feature and, and really take that uh, and, and run with it to make sure that, you know, the product that we built also really works commercially. You know, at the end of the day, we, we were in the, you know, we're a food delivery business, grocery delivery business. We, we're, we ship physical things. So very important that you get local buy-in and local stakeholders to really you know, work with you to build an amazing product. You mentioned something that I, I, I want to double down on, like the, you had this, this head of a certain country that wants a specific feature. So from a product standpoint, as you think about building a platform that can support different ads, different use cases, what is it that you need to do to allow this type of custom experience while maintaining a platform that can support other types of custom experiences and still feel like you have a consistent brand? You know, one thing that um, I feel like, you know, we, we I've, I've taught product also, and, and we, we when we talk about product, we try and generalize prioritization matrices into, oh, you can use the rice framework or this framework, that framework to, to simplify all of your decision making. And look, to be to a certain extent, we try to, right? We try and break it down into, look, if we, Qatar wants this and the UAE wants this and Egypt wants this, and we kind of break, break it down to like upside potential, potential GMV uplift of investing in feature X versus feature Y. We have a, you know, frequent prioritization and that conversation happens. But I think there's a nuance to this, which is sometimes a big strategic view. So perhaps, you know, Iraq is a massive growth market for us. So, you know, they're, 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 they're this size, whereas Kuwait is massive. And any feature request that they have and say, hey, I want to build this for my, for my local market may not get prioritized if you put it in a, in a nice Excel spreadsheet. But sometimes when you invest in to realize, hey, in five years, Iraq's going to be in a very different place. And that's a massive growth market for us. You do things that you know have a strategic lens to it that that sort of supersedes your 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 black and white prioritization process. Um, but of course, you know as much as possible, we try and build very generic solutions um, that works across all the different markets. Because at the end of the day, that's a value proposition of having one product that serves multiple markets. Otherwise, we would just ship eight different apps, right? Um, but yeah, so you know, I guess my 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 long winded answer to that is, I think 
it's not always straightforward. And I think that that's where um, the subjectivity and, and the, the, the understanding of where the company should go and the strategic lens of where we should invest is really important. I mean, if you think about it, um, a lot, most of PMs are focused on one product. So they might have clarity on their strategy. From your point of view, as you think about a portfolio of products across different countries, like strategy truly becomes a product in itself. So trying to prioritize priorities is something that I that I think as an exe- someone turns into an executive has to pay more attention to. And, and you mentioned some frameworks. I'm sure they help structure thinking, but ultimately there's certain nuances to each of those companies that yes, yes, don't apply by the book. Yeah. I've come to realize also that like I have very little influence over the next quarter in reality, right? I think the time horizon that I'm really thinking about things is probably the next year, potentially the next two years, next three years. And and so many things come into that, right? Really thinking about team structure, really thinking about the, the, the bench of leadership that we need to hire, really thinking about the skills that we need to gain, really thinking about what trends are going to come that we need to prepare for, right? Like think about, for example, like to be able to build the personalized experiences you have today, man, we had to make a decision probably two years ago to start building the foundations of it. And there are decisions that I'm making today that will impact this in two years. And I think that's the complexity of, of, of product leadership, which is, you know, you can't make a decision today and it just happens tomorrow. There's just so much groundwork that needs to happen before things really come to life. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I think one of the Achilles heel and, 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 and dangers of product leadership is when you become an executive, like, oh, well, you know, I just do big picture thinking and, and, and resource allocation. That's my job. I also think that's not right because at the end of the day, like as product people, like we're builders, right? We all came into this discipline because we wanted to build products that could change the world and, and change customer experience. And I think we shouldn't lose that soul. Mm-hmm. So personally, how I do it is, you know, I every quarter I pick two, three, potentially four topics that I personally sponsor. I go really deep. I spend a lot of time with the teams, perhaps even bi-weekly, you know, looking at data, looking at experiences, doing product reviews. I think even as we scale, like I really don't want to lose touch of that because I think it's a very important part of, of doing product and, and really enjoying the craft also. And let's talk about talent, product talent in this case. How are you able to acquire the, the talent that you need to build such a you know, tech-focused business in a region that is obviously growing really fast, but product wasn't a thing probably not too long ago? Yeah, I can tell you all the stories with it. I mean, I recall when I, you know, when I, when I moved here five years ago, six years ago, when I would call up candidates, they'll be like, you, you want me to move to the Middle East? Like, I don't understand. Like, why? <laughs> you know, I think now it's a very different story. You know, we've, we've grown the industry so much. And the Middle East is getting a ton of investment, a lot of successful startups. We've had successful exits like Talabat, Delivery Hero, and, and, and others also, you know, more recently. And I think it's, it's put us on the map. I think it's getting easier. Um, but one thing that, you know, I, I focus a lot on is potential, right? So we're working a lot with universities. We're working a lot with... Uh, with with schools around to actually build longer term pipeline, right? Um, we, for example, you know, building relationships with universities that teach you know engineering and data, and actually hiring people out of school now and and really grooming them in, in, into um, into product leaders and and and, and data leaders. Uh, we had an associate program which we launched about two years ago that we take people you know from different industries and we bring them and teach them to be product managers. Um, we've successfully turned uh, a couple of product managers, you know, one from QA engineering into a product manager. More recently, actually, someone came from VC and eventually became a product manager. So, you know, when, when, when you put in a situation where you don't have all the talent in the world ready, you know, just across the street, you get very creative about building that talent pipeline. And, 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 and I think that long-term investment, um, I think it's starting to pay off, you know, I've been in the company now for four years, uh, it's starting to make a lot of sense, you know, the investments that we made two or three years ago. And what about you? How do you invest in your own personal growth? Yeah, I think um, it gets harder over time. You know, I recall, you know, five, six, seven years ago when I was a much more junior product leader, I could, I don't know, read a, read a book every week and, and really digest. Um, now it's getting harder. You know, things are getting busier. I have a, I have a family now, um, but I still try and make time for personal growth and reflection. You know, so one thing I do a lot is... Um, I actually have a bit of a framework that I go through, you know, every month where I think about where do I want to grow? What are some things that I'm working on myself, uh, you know, from between mental health and physical health and, and, and career. And I think being deliberate about it and realizing there's some areas that you don't work on and maybe getting a coach for it uh, or reading books about it, I think is very helpful. 
Um, but I think in the in a lot of companies like Talaba, where things move really fast, it's very easy for leaders to just get caught up in the busyness of things. And, and I think it's um, it's dangerous because that's when also you can catch up with the growth of the company and growth of the business. So it's very important, in my personal opinion, that to, to sometimes slow down to speed up, to really be reflective and think about where you want to go um, and, and and the tools that you need to, to, to build up for that. So what do you think is next for your business? I mean, you've expanded to different countries, you are going deep, uh, you're expanding within multiple, you're yeah, offering different services. Is, is going outside the Middle East an option or is there enough potential within your current region? Yeah. Honestly, I think the region is like super early. I mean, look at the population of Egypt, or population of almost 100 million people. And, um, you know, I can tell you that there's so many people in, in, in the region that we haven't even reached our product to yet, right? And I think that, you know, as um, uh, mobile phones become more accessible, internet plans become more accessible, and, you know, e-commerce becomes a bit more of a norm across the region, in the next three to five years, just organically, there's going to be so much growth in, 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 in the region. On top of that, you know, as we graduate from food to groceries to other verticals, I also think that people will start using us for a bunch of different use cases. And um, and so at the moment, we're not looking at other, you know, countries that we want to expand into. Um, and more importantly, I think it's important for us to really think about how we can serve our customers currently in a much deeper and more holistic way. We need to talk about AI. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a, a yeah, good of course. Interview. Yeah, <laughs> always. Um, you know, obviously, the, all the buzz that is, that's, that's been around for some time now, but really curious to see what is that, what's happening, you know, uh, yeah. outside the U.S. in this case, in, in the Middle East, and how you are applying specific uh, AI use cases to improve your, your own business. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of things that we're doing, some things internally, some things externally. You know, internally, we're even trying things like if you open our app today and you go to our restaurant page and you see, wow, we have so many different cuisines and all these different by market. Well, guess what? Those, those cuisine images, AI generated. You know, you can do that really at scale. Right. Or, you know, when you open a menu and, you know, you're ordering a sandwich, you know, from Subway, let's say, and you have all these options, right? You can, you know, add an onion and add a pickle and things like that. Well, maybe if Subway doesn't upload a picture of an onion pickle, we can generate that for you. So, you know, when you have tens of thousands of restaurants and you need to do that scale, you start to realize that AI becomes really an assistant to really scale things up. And I'm really excited to explore, you know, as a very ops heavy business, what optimizations we can have there. So we're doing that. The second piece here is really thinking about the customer experience, right? You know, one thing that we're exploring at the moment is, you know, um, how AI can help with, with recipe generation. So we actually have a couple of experiments now live where, you know, you can go to our grocery store and say, hey, I'm in the mood for, um, I'm vegetarian. I'm in the mood for cooking Indian food. What should I make tonight? It recommends you a recipe. It gives you, you know, some options of ingredients that you can buy, you know, to, 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 to cook the recipe. It delivers to you in 20 minutes or less. And we're excited to be able to sort of see how consumers are using it, right? Um, you know, we're looking at things like uh, we're, we're recognizing that some places people are doing things like voice ordering or text ordering. We don't do that today, but it's is it something that we're, we're thinking about? Absolutely. You know, and I think as uh, you think about embedded um, uh, technologies like, you know, whether it's Siri or Alexa or, or Google Home, like I'm sure it's it's in short order that that these devices will be, you know, powered by one of these, you know, AI providers. That, and I think that opens up a lot of doors for us to, to also, you know, think about experiences that we can build on top of that. Um, I want to take us to the dark side of product for a second, or I would, I should call it not dark, but like the, the not so spoken about side of product, which is when things don't go well. And, and what are some of those repercussions? So, I'm, you know, you're big on talking about vulnerability was one of the topics that you, during your previous talk at, at product school. How do you, how do you acquire that type of self-awareness to recognize, hey, there is something that is not going well. And, and I want to acknowledge that as a leader to kind of set the tone and, and show people that it's okay to, to express that and that we are not superheroes at all times. I think this is probably one of the hardest things for product leaders you know, as product leaders, we're often put in situations where, you know, everyone's looking at you and be like, what's the answer? You know, you know, the engineering team's looking at you, design teams are looking at you, the business teams are looking at you. And and I feel like as product leaders, you're always sort of somehow in the intersection of everyone's questions and the expectations for you to always have a polished, clean answer of how we should approach a problem. 
And I think, look, there's some obviously some truth and some responsibility as product leaders. Our job is to bring clarity and bring structure and to be able to answer a lot of those questions. But I think it's an incredible and just immense amount of burden that falls on product leaders. And I think that if that continues to pile up over and over and over again, it actually affects decision making. Because at the end of the day, a product decision is a bet. And I think the best product organizations are willing to take bets that may or may not pay off, right? It's, you know, uh, the best tech companies have half their bets, a third of their pet bets really, really paying off. And I think we, we need to build cultures where, you know, as leaders, failing in an experiment, failing in a direction, failing quickly is probably not a bad thing. Because otherwise, you'll have tech organizations that invest a year or two years, three years into directions that don't make sense. So I think as leaders, whether product or you have a CEO of a company, it's very important to build a culture where, you know, vulnerability is okay. That failure is celebrated to some degree if there's a massive learning that comes out at the, at the, at the end of it. Um, and I think the first step is it takes at the top of an organization leaders to be truly vulnerable, authentic, and bring their true selves, you know, to to work, um, to really model that they don't know all the answers. And in many cases, I don't know all the answers. You know, I, I'm happy to whiteboard with you and think it through with you. Um, but when leaders start to demonstrate that they don't know all the answers and they're here to also just work out problems with you, it really brings out that, you know, to, to other people that, ah, maybe it's okay for me to also not know all the answers. So um, I don't, again, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't admit to, to having, you know, had this perfect, but I have a commitment, you know, I really want to build organizations that have that element of, of authenticity, you know, in leadership. And, and I think uh, product people in general would just love to work in an environment like that over, you know, massively stressful environments that just have more and more and more things piled on on their shoulders. And I think I, I also have a, a part to play here because when we started product school uh, 10 years ago, way before product was cool in the US, like we started seeing and kind of the first generation product leaders or people that were product leaders, but, but they didn't get a formal product training. They had these incredible backgrounds, right? You could tell like they went to great business schools or they were former engineers, former founders, VCs, and everybody had this beautiful story on paper, but they didn't get to know them. Yes, because they didn't have a platform. And, and uh, one of the things that I've been trying to do, obviously, is to celebrate them because clearly they're there for good reasons, but also showcase some of the things that didn't go well uh, to prove the point that it is possible to get there and nobody really had a straight path. If anything, these people, you want to give back to the next generation of product leaders because there was no place for them to actually become PM. So uh, maybe there are some examples that you could share with us on things that maybe didn't go well and um, and how they influence where you are today. Yeah, many. I mean, I, it's, it's really hard to name, but I've made horrible product decisions, right? Probably investments in, in redesigns that took too long that really didn't get to move a business metric. You know, I think very early on in your career, you know, as product people, you're 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 almost trained to just go all in and 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 take big swings, but you know, not necessarily really thinking it through or or or, or de-risking or doing the right product discovery. And I think the hardest part about product is that there's so many little elements that you have to to learn about before you build that that sort of that that stomach lining of how you take a good product decision. You know, so I would say that, you know, early on in my career, I probably took too long to make decisions. I probably made really big bets without really thinking about the implications. Um, and, you know, no specific example comes to mind. But, you know, as as any good product leader would tell you, or anyone who's been in the industry for more than 10 years, you look back five years and like, you're like, oh, wow, like I, I was really not a very good product leader at all. And uh, I think that's a mark of, you know, having grown a lot also, you know, over the over the years. Yeah, even the term product leader is relatively new. Like we still see a lot of companies that do not have a chief product officer. It's happening, which is which is good. Uh, but in many cases, that's still under technology or under marketing. So I'm very curious in your case as a chief product officer, how was that? When was that role created and, and why? Mm. Look, I think um, at, at, at Talabat, uh, it was created actually when I came in uh, about four years ago. It was a recognition at the time, I guess, that uh, we're a consumer product at the end of the day. You know, yes, we have lots and lots of bikers and we're delivering all these orders at the end of the day, but the interface that people, you know, think about when they think about the app, uh, think about your your brand, is the app. 
right? It's not what you say on a billboard. It's not what it says on your bike. It's that experience when they open the app and what it's like when they see a restaurant, click on a restaurant, click on a menu item, order something, and, and what it looks like when, when the, the food is coming. So, you know, there was a recognition at the time to say, look, like, you know, you can't just invest on everything else and not the product. So let's invest in the product, which is, you know, explains why we've, we five x the team size over the last four years, but also recognizing that, you know, we need to invest in, in the discipline of product management, in the discipline of data science, in the discipline of design, all of this really coming together holistically to build the product function. So um, I've had the uh, pleasure of being able to, to, to ride through a lot of that wave and, and, and grow with it. But uh, Yiwei, thank you for your time with us and, and sharing some of your lessons learned. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Carlos. Have a great day.